Hello, it's Aaron here at the Battle of Preston Pan's Jacobite Museum in East Lothian, Scotland, with the latest video update of our What If interactive war game campaign. Now, there's been loads happening in the second half of December 1745, but before we get into the campaign, I just want to say a warm welcome to all those new subscribers who've joined us in the last couple of weeks. And of course, uh, a continuing thank you to all those who've been following loyally for several months now. I hope everybody's caught up on how the campaign has been progressing so far before we get into the meat of what's been happening in the last few weeks. In our last video, of course, as you'll recall, the Jacobites concluded the siege of Newcastle rather unexpectedly after the covering force left behind in the siege lines was attacked by the garrison. Marshal Wade was defeated and the Jacobites followed up on their success outside the city uh, by taking the walls and progressing to secure the city itself. So Newcastle had fallen to the Jacobites by the end of the last video. So just to remind ourselves of the strategic situation, going back to our trusty 18th century maps, here is Newcastle itself, sat on the River Tyne, now controlled by the Jacobite army. Further upstream, however, is the main Jacobite force at a place called Newburn, uh, where they're able to control a set of strategic fords across the River Tyne. Now, the Jacobite army had moved there because of the approach of the Duke of Cumberland, whose army was hopefully coming up to relieve Newcastle. But rather than trying to uh, link up with the garrison by going through Gateshead, Cumberland's army had come across uh, and had headed towards those fords at Newburn in the hope of outflanking the Jacobite siege lines. The Jacobites had, of course, got there first. Newburn is a very short march from Newcastle, so the Prince's army was able to get there pretty efficiently, and Charles Edward took up a defensive position centred on the village of Newburn, commanding the fords. And just as the Scottish army had done at Newburn uh, over a hundred years before in the Bishops' Wars, the Jacobites mounted a cannon in the tower of the church at Newburn, which could fire right across the river uh, onto the enemy positions on the other side, should Cumberland attempt to force the fords. Now, during the Bishops' Wars, the Scots army had been the aggressor and was attacking from the north side to the south. On this occasion, however, the Jacobites are on the defensive. They control the village and the high ground overlooking the fords, and they're hoping that Cumberland will lead his army across those fords into the teeth of the Jacobite fire. The fords are tidal too, and so there'll be a limited amount of time in which Cumberland's army could attack. All in all, once Cumberland got there and scouted out the position, it was pretty clear that he would not be able to lead his army across this river successfully whilst it was contested. So perhaps wisely, in fact undoubtedly wisely, the Duke of Cumberland decided he was not going to try and force a battle at Newburn, but would go upstream towards Corbridge in the search of another safer crossing point. The Jacobites voted to shadow that motion, and so they took their army out of Newburn, and they headed off uh, through Hedden on the Wall and headed towards Corbridge as well. But when they got there, they found that the Redcoats weren't there. The Jacobites, in fact, therefore removed themselves back to Newburn, checking that it wasn't a ruse. And when they couldn't find the Redcoats either at Newburn or at uh, Corbridge, they then withdrew to Newcastle, fearing that somehow the Redcoat forces had got across the river without them knowing. In fact, the Duke of Cumberland had not got as far as Corbridge. He had got it far enough to commit the Jacobites, and then he had withdrawn and headed south. Now, at this point, Charles Edward could have pursued, but the Jacobite Council, voting on our Facebook page, decided that they were going to be much more cautious. They were going to spend a few days consolidating and resupplying in Newcastle. We are, of course, in the depths of winter. They also celebrated the Prince's 25th birthday in Newcastle, whilst sending cavalry forces southwards uh, along the Great North Road to see if they could locate the Duke of Cumberland. So after gaining a few days grace over the Jacobites, the Duke of Cumberland was able to take his army down the Great North Road to Durham and from thence to Sunderland Bridge, where he took up a strong position, commanding the river crossing over the weir with a burn protecting his right. To make sure the Jacobites came charging straight down the road into that defensive position, the bridges at Durham were blown, preventing them being able to outflank Cumberland on that side. 
But as I've mentioned, the Jacobites voted to be cautious. They didn't lead the army straight down the road in Cumberland's wake. Instead, they spent a few days resting at Newcastle whilst Kilmarnock's cavalry units went searching out for Cumberland and the best approaches to his positions. They successfully identified both that the crossings at Durham were broken and that Cumberland was prepared for battle at Sunderland Bridge. The Jacobites, when they were good and ready, came down the Great North Road and then headed off to Brantsperth Castle, where they would have some sheltered position whilst deciding how to deal with Cumberland's position at Sunderland Bridge. Now, Cumberland is under quite a lot of pressure now. He has successfully kept his army together, although he narrowly failed to relieve Newcastle. He avoided falling into a battle on the enemy's terms, and he has a strong force that he's managed to keep between his enemy and their target, London. But the newspapers reporting Prince Charlie celebrating Christmas in Newcastle have really not gone down very well with Cumberland's father, King George, and so Cumberland is eager to find a way to force the Jacobites to battle, to either destroy them or, at the very least, to push them back out of England. In that sense, his position at Sunderland Bridge is slightly problematic because the Jacobites have been sufficiently cautious to be alerted to its strength. The position is just as strong as Charles Edwards was at Newburn, and there was no way that the Jacobites were going to launch an attack across the stone bridge over the river into the teeth of the enemy's fire. Now, the Jacobites vote neither to attack at Sunderland Bridge nor to withdraw to the Tyne and instead to find a way of getting past Cumberland to seek an engagement. So they put a small screaming force in front of Sunderland Bridge to fix the Redcoats' attention while sending the main army round to Bishop Auckland to secure the river crossing there. Cumberland's concern, of course, is that if he moves his army out from Sunderland Bridge, then he exposes his rear, and if he doesn't, then he allows the Jacobites over the river of Bishop Auckland and potentially allows them to bypass his position altogether and penetrate further south, creating yet more military and political pressure for the Duke. So he sends a cavalry force straight down towards Bishop Auckland in the hope that they at least might be able to slow the Jacobites down by contesting the river crossing and therefore forcing the Jacobites to face him in battle once the two armies are arrayed. So that leads us into this landscape here and for reasons that will become self-evident uh, I want to spend a little bit of time looking at the area in front of us. Firstly note the line of the River Weir which snakes around this side of the landscape uh, and there are uh, two crossing points in this area. There's a little ford uh, at uh, Byers Green there onto a plateau and there is the main crossing, better for an army, of course, at Bishop Auckland, down in the bottom left. Now, uh, as well as the little village of Briars Green there, there is Bobby Shafto's estate at Whitworth there, a very fine hall. There's an old lodge park in the middle, not a very substantial feature. Uh, there are the Roman remains at Binchester Fort, and then there is the park and Bishop's Palace at Bishop Auckland itself. Other than that, the most striking feature is this very long, very tall ridge that runs across the area with the villages of Westerton, Kirk Merrington and Ferry on the Hill. At the side of which, marking the right hand side of the landscape, is an area known as the Cars, a steep geological cutting. The rest of the area is unenclosed open moorland, uh, the Spenny Moor. Now, just for convenience sake, uh, before the next slide, I've turned this map onto its side uh, so that now we have the river running along here, Bishop Auckland in the top left corner rather than the bottom left corner. Now, the Jacobites are trying to cross the river at Bishop Auckland, so they will be coming into this area in this direction uh, if they want to secure the ridge or they will be heading off behind the ridge uh, if they want to penetrate deeper into England. Patrols from the government forces at uh, Sunderland Bridge will be coming down this road here uh, towards the crossing point at Bishop Auckland. And they would have the option, if they were early enough, of either contesting the river crossing or at least trying to contest the Jacobite possession of the ridge at Westerton. 
Now, the purpose of doing this would be to prevent the Jacobites from being able to simply march on deeper into England. If they were to, able to force a cavalry engagement here, uh, then it would delay the Jacobites long enough to allow Cumberland's main body to come down and force a battle on this landscape. So as ever, we now transfer that 18th century map onto our tabletop, and you can see at the top of the map, we therefore have the uh, river crossing and Bishop Auckland Palace. Next to that, there are on a little plateau overlooking the river, the Roman remains at uh, Binchester. Then there is the long high ridge leading down to the cars with the villages of Westerton, Kirk Merrington and Ferry on the Hill. The open moorland in front of the ridge with the uh, uh, old lodge park there uh, and Bobby Shafto's place uh, and Briar's Green uh, on a plateau behind it. So this is the landscape in which the Redcoat Cavalry are now trying to contest the Jacobite River crossing. Taking a closer look down onto the table, the Bishop's Palace at Bishop Auckland. On our tabletop, I fear not half as grand as the buildings are in reality. The small village of Westerton on the western end of the ridge. Uh, under construction is Thomas Wright's observatory tower. You can see a photograph of the completed tower there, but we know that by 1745, uh, just early works had begun on its construction. There a view on the left of Kirk Merrington uh, on the top of that very steep ridge looking down across the moorland. A picture from that ridge line uh, inset there so that you can get a sense of just how uh, significant this ridge is in dominating the landscape before it. And over from the other side at Briars Green looking down on Bobby Shafto's mansion, the old lodge park there on the right uh, and uh, Kirk Merrington on the ridge in the centre, ferry on the hill further off in the distance. So now we know where we are, we know uh, what we are trying to achieve, and we come to the skirmish at Westerton uh, as it's determined whether the Jacobites will be forced to fight a full-scale battle or whether they will march past and head deeper into England. So just to remind you, we've got our Jacobite army coming across the bridge at Bishop Auckland in this direction. They are preceded by their cavalry forces, and once all of the cavalry forces are on the table, then uh, we'll be rolling each uh, Jacobite regiment in turn to see if they can be fed onto the battlefield as the army arrives from Bransmouth. The Redcoat forces likewise will feed their cavalry on one regiment at a time uh, from the direction of Sunderland Bridge, but the main body of the British army is further behind, so they will not be reinforced. So the Jacobites will have the advantage the longer that the battle goes on, and that's why the Redcoat's objective is simply to inflict as much damage as they can in the early phase of the battle, uh, and therefore force the Jacobites uh, to stay and engage. The Jacobite objective, of course, is to try and secure as strong a position as they possibly can, inflict as much damage as they can on the British cavalry uh, before the main bodies arrive. Uh, the Jacobites, as it turns out, are just as eager for an engagement as the Redcoats. So the engagement begins with the first Jacobite cavalry units reaching the bridge at Bishop Auckland. Strathallan's horse are leading the way. And with a successful roll, they not only get onto the table over the bridge, but they then continue past Bishop Auckland's palace uh, and head up towards Westerton. Meanwhile, on the far side of the Spenny Moor, the British force is led by the Georgia Rangers, a small unit which was destined to be sent to the American colonies when the war broke out here at home uh, and uh, they were redirected to join Cumberland's forces. And the Rangers have ridden onto the Sperry Moor uh, with good speed, uh, hoping to get as far towards Westerton as they can in the early stage of the battle and secure that ridge. Now, the Jacobites actually make a little bit of a mistake at this point in the engagement. They order uh, a charge, but it doesn't strike home. They have mismeasured on the table uh, and they leave themselves stuck uh, just a short distance in front of the Georgia Rangers, uh, in front of that little cottage there on the Spenny Moor. This gives enough space for the Georgia Rangers, who were in danger of being caught in column, uh, on their next move to be able to deploy, ready to receive Strathallan's horse. 
And the Redcoat forces are rolling very successfully and they get uh, a regiment of dragoons onto the field behind the Georgia Rangers. And this is where it potentially gets dangerous for the Jacobite cavalry. They've already taken a pretty bloody nose at the Third Battle of Dunbar, although they've been slightly reinforced by some new troops at Newcastle. But the Jacobite cavalry are all small units uh, and not able really to stand up against uh, a determined charge by these full-time professional cavalrymen. So General Husk uh, moves his forces up and you can see uh, Kerr's dragoons moving out there on the left, uh, forming into line, threatening the flank uh, of Strathallan's small unit of horse who are facing against the Georgia Rangers. So the skirmish gets underway with a clash between the Georgia Rangers and the Strathallan horse. But as you can see, uh, Kerr's dragoons moving round there on the flank, looking very ominous uh, for Strathallan, especially since the Jacobites have not been rolling so well as the Redcoats, and most of their cavalry forces are still lumbering their way up past Bishop Auckland towards Westerton. Strathallans are looking a little bit exposed down here on the Spenny Moor alone. Meanwhile, Kilmarnock is trying to force his uh, troops along down from the ridge uh, towards the moor to help Strathallans, and he's successfully got Derwentwater's Dragoons onto the field. That's the first English unit raised by the Jacobites so far, made up of men from Northumbria, uh, and Pitsligo's horse uh, coming up behind them, and you can see them here heading down the ridge uh, to try and reinforce uh, Strathallans' position. And it's just as well because that position is now extremely vulnerable. The Dragoons have charged the flank of Strathallan's position down by the road and the Georgia Rangers are now supported to their rear by the emergence of the Yorkshire Hunters, a new militia mounted unit uh, which has been raised uh, in the last couple of weeks. Perhaps inevitably Strathallan's force is unable to hold on and they are driven off. Fortunately, they are only driven backwards. They are not destroyed at this stage of the battle. Uh, the Georgia Rangers have also taken a little bit of a battering during that contest and the Yorkshire Hunters have therefore moved forwards uh, to screen the Georgia Rangers from any further damage uh, and the Dragoons have reformed to their front uh, looking across towards Westerton where the Jacobites have formed a line uh, now that more of their regiments have come up. And when Kerr's Dragoons go charging up towards Westerton, they are countercharged by Derwentwater's horse. And uh, when the Yorkshire Hunters rush forwards as well, they are charged by uh, Balmerino's lifeguards, uh, Strathallans and Pitsligos, forming the Jacobite second line beyond. And you can see at the top of the image here, uh, the final regiment of dragoons, Cobhams, have got onto the field. Uh, but they, rather than engaging in the melee across the edge of the moor, uh, they are moving up the ridge uh, towards the flank of the Jacobite position and potentially to secure that high ground and block the passage for any further Jacobite reinforcements. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Kerr's Dragoons have the upper hand when they smash into uh, the Jacobite cavalry in front of them. They drive back Derwentwater's men, uh, and as they withdraw up the ridge, uh, there's a sweeping charge by the Dragoons that smashes into Pitsligo's horse in the second line behind. And after a devastating short, sharp combat, Pitsligo's horse are driven from the field, utterly defeated. That leaves the Jacobites in a very vulnerable position. Just to highlight it for you here, right at the top, there is a Balmerino's lifeguards, disordered and driven back up towards Westerton. There's the Strathallan horse, uh, who'd been blooded at the start of the battle and then driven back to this post here. So they already have casualties. And then engaged with the Yorkshire hunters, uh, we have Derwentwater's English Jacobites there. Pitsligos have fled the field. And surprisingly, uh, Kerr's Dragoons uh, continue their uh, charge, uh, believing nothing can stand in their way now, uh, and they rush up the hill uh, towards Balmerinos. Balmerinos, although they're disadvantaged both by the small size of their unit and by their disorder from the previous combat, they have the advantage of being on the high ground, uh, and so do have an opportunity at least to try and hold their position, which initially at least they do. 
And finally, after a succession of failed order rolls, the Duke of Perth starts getting infantry up onto the field over the bridge at Bishop Auckland. And so we see Kilmarnock's foot guards and John Roy Stewart's regiment rushing up towards Westerton from Bishop Auckland in the hope that they might be able to retrieve the situation that the Jacobite cavalry has got itself into. Once again, Kerr's dragoons are eventually successful, but they are able to drive back Balmerino's lifeguards, not destroy them. And by pulling back, Balmerino's have managed to actually get themselves into a position from which they are supported by John Roy Stewart's regiment. Kerr's are now within musket range of John Roy Stewart's, but because of the rise in the ground, we've determined uh, that they are not uh, visible uh, to the Jacobite volleys. Meanwhile, uh, as you can see on the top corner of the uh, picture there, uh, Cobham's dragoons have got up the ridge and formed into line on the edge of Kirk Merrington, uh, the highest part of the ridge, in a very strong position, denying access for the Jacobites uh, to that height. And at this point, uh, there was a lot of consideration given as to whether these dragoons should dismount and take post occupying the buildings of the village uh, to make a real headache uh, for the advancing forces, or whether they should remain in line so that if the Jacobites attempted to move up into the village on the ridge, uh, they would be able to sweep downwards in a devastating charge. For the moment, however, after a failed order, they simply stay where they are. Meanwhile, back on the Spennymoor, Derwin Waters' men are still locked with the Yorkshire Hunters, and despite their own casualties, Strathallan's horse have come down in support. We know that the Georgian Rangers have got uh, a, a pretty bloody nose, uh, and so the Jacobites have got a sense that they might just be able to gain some capital here uh, by uh, doing some damage on these smaller uh, Redcoat cavalry units. And Derwin Waters' men are in fact successful. They drive the Yorkshire Hunters back along the road, uh, to Spennymoor House, uh, but there's no opportunity because it was a continuing engagement for them to launch a sweeping charge against the exposed Georgia Rangers. That could have been devastating uh, as their casualties were already rather high. At this point, however, the Jacobite cavalry units, all of whom are now blooded, uh, start to wonder whether, since the infantry is pulling up uh, through into the heights behind, discretion might be the better part of valour. And in fact, on their next turn, the Jacobite cavalry do disengage from the moor uh, and pull back to the plateau at Binchester and the remains of the old Roman fort there, uh, where they attempt to consolidate. At the same time, the Jacobite infantry move up onto the ridge at Westerton, uh, where they have a close range volley that blasts into Kerr's dragoons and successfully inflicts three casualty hits upon them. Now, at this point, although late in the day, the two regiments of Husk's Dragoons that were up on the ridge could have gone all or nothing and launched charges against the Jacobite infantry. But since they'd already suffered from volley fire and taken hits uh, and they were now uh, some distance away from their commander, uh, it was decided that discretion was the better part of valour here as well. And so, preserving their strength for the coming engagement, uh, the two regiments successfully disengaged and withdrew down the ridge back onto the Spenny Moor to link back up with the Yorkshire Hunters and the Georgia Rangers. The British cavalry had done its job. It had made uh, the Jacobite crossing at Bishop Auckland a little bit messy. It had forced the Jacobite cavalry out onto the moor and then pushed them into Binchester, which means there's now no chance of the Jacobite army, should it have wished to, slipping deeper into England. Instead, the Jacobite army, which is now busily crossing the river, will have to deploy in this landscape and face Cumberland's main army. And, to boot, they've destroyed Pitsligo's cavalry unit, weakening the Jacobite army before that critical engagement. In the wake of the battle, the Jacobites continued to feed their men across the river and took up a position along the ridge between Westerton and Ferry on the Hill. All the time they were observed by the uh, British cavalry uh, out on the Spenny Moor, whilst the main body of Cumberland's army continued down from Sunderland Bridge. They will soon draw up their position on the far side of the Spenny Moor, and here, in this landscape, will be fought what may well be the decisive battle of our campaign. 
Give us a few days and this battle will be fought out across the tabletop and I look forward to be able to report to you the outcome of the Battle of Spennymoor.